we just take a moment to soften into presence together. Just notice if there's any tension in your body or your mind. And just touch it lovingly with affectionate awareness. Coming into the felt sense of being and out of the noisiness of the mind. Just let all the sounds that are arising be here as they are, without resisting. Notice that they arise and subside in the presence of awareness. the presence of awareness, nothing would be registered as an experience. So we know without question that there is awareness here. And when we soften our defenses to whatever is arising in this moment, we notice that the natural inclination of awareness is affection, love, simple, open, spacious, joyful presence. So notice if there's any muscular tension in your body. It could be in your face or your jaw, your neck chest, solar plexus, stomach, or in your legs or arms. And just warmly embrace whatever that sensation is with the gentleness that would you, you would use to kiss a sleeping baby on the forehead. It is essential that you approach yourself with this level of gentleness and kindness and that you not place pressure on your body or your mind. This is an act of self-love or of devotion to yourself. If you approach yourself with harshness, with rigidity, with violence, you are doing yourself harm. dropping here all of our knowledge and memories, our associations, our projections, our limiting beliefs, our biography, our resumes, and just being here as the presence of awareness, which is our common source and substance. There is no you or me in awareness.
awareness is total equality. The true meaning of democracy. so often in my teaching is soften because it's such a simple unpretentious pointer to your essence which is fundamentally innocent undefended sensitive all welcoming astonishingly loving and affectionate. You have to do nothing to gain any of that. It is your nature. All we're doing in this moment together is refraining from being anything that we're not. Anything other than that. natural state is revealed to be here shining with warmth and affection and intimacy and radiant light and clarity, conscious presence, a sober, clear, clean presence. untouched by memory or projection. And just notice how much the body loves this message, how much it delights in being reminded of its innocence. And just keep feeling into that goodness, that original goodness never left you and never will if only you would dare to be that rest for a couple more hmm, seconds, few, maybe another minute or so, just rest in the comfort of your own being, be comfortable in your own skin as it were, there is no threat in this moment, so you can let down your defenses. be at peace. couple seconds just is so exquisite this presence here just sipping on it like the nectar inside a flower like a hummingbird sipping on this nectar it's a very rare invitation in the human kingdom so we just 
bow down to this ourselves a little bit longer with devotion and gratitude. in the cave of the heart, we thank consciousness, the self, the absolute, your own self, for this nourishing, <coughs> life-giving awareness. Just take a moment to open your eyes very gently and just take in the visual scene. And notice that the presence of awareness is untouched. It's still here, shining as the current visual scene. So nothing has changed. Your being hasn't moved one inch, although the sights and the sounds, the textures, the smells, all of that's changing, but there's a common denominator, which is the presence of awareness. So this is very, very simple, and there's nothing esoteric about this. The packaging of this teaching throughout the centuries has been very esoteric, coming largely from the East, although there are our precedents for this in the West as well. But if we just take away all of the esoteric packaging and we just soften into and intuitively sense into this <coughs> presence of awareness, which is not Eastern or Western or male or female, it's not Indian or American or British, it is well, it is what I call the greatest mystery shining in full evidence because when we look for awareness we cannot find it. No scientist, no doctor, no engineer has ever found or ever will find awareness. No doctor ever cut into a brain and found a pocket of it. It's not in space or time and yet here we are in full awareness of this moment. So it's not a question of approaching something outside of yourself to get something. It's simply a question of recognizing what has always already been the case. Your own presence, which we neglect to recognize the significance of. It is that simple. We do not recognize the profundity of the most basic element of experience, without which no experience would be possible. No awareness no experience. It is so obvious that it goes without saying. And it is so obvious that it goes without being recognized. Just like Rumi says, the fish swimming in the ocean looking for the water. The spiritual search is us swimming in awareness looking for awareness. So for years, if I could tell you a little story about the Michael character. For years I was in search of this, and in search of uh, a heart awakening, in search of love, in search of fulfillment and truth, in search of being fully present to myself, comfortable in my own skin. This is the common human story. Who here hasn't been on that journey at one time or another? And maybe you're still on that journey. When I recognized the simplicity of what I'm pointing to and then started to bring that into my felt sense, into uh, the cellular sort of experience of, of bodily existence, everything shifted, you know, quite dramatically, actually. When the simplicity of this was recognized and accepted, and that is important, that we allow ourselves to, to accept the simplicity of the message, you know, and not overcomplicate it with the mind to simply recognize, oh yes, of course, of course, I've always been that. And I've simply imagined myself to be something other than that. And we 
just root the body and the mind into the 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 immense <coughs> presence of this awareness which has never moved a great deal of our suffering just evaporates a great deal of it a great deal of confusion evaporates naturally so we're no longer seeking something in the realm of the mind we're no longer seeking a relationship or a substance or some experience that will give us what we feel we lack but that we recognize the fullness of the totality of this presence as myself so in the book um, boundless awareness it's really leading the reader it's a guided journey uh, into the simplicity of what I'm pointing to in this moment and it is a matter of letting go of all of our conditioned beliefs and ideas and recognizing um, that which abides prior to all of those beliefs and conditionings. Not prior to in time, but timelessly. Prior to timelessly. You are prior to the first tick, the first second, as awareness. So there's nothing new in this message, it is a timeless message. It's not as though this message changes with fads or with the times. It has nothing to do with a new age sort of uh, rap of some kind. It's the timeless fact of our being, which in one million years will be identical. It will be identical to the reality of this moment. This is what in the mystical traditions is called the I amness. The sense of I amness, the sense of presence, the sense I know I am. It's a conscious presence. So the question is, I know I am, but what, what is it that I am? What am I? Who am I? We could begin with either of those questions. And rejecting everything that comes and goes and just noticing the intuitive sense of presence which is here timelessly and that is myself and the recognition of that as myself is what we could call awakening or self-realization or enlightenment those are big fancy terms for the for the simplest most direct experience of what you are so a big part of this is I talked about in, I talk about in the book and I tried to guide you in the meditation to notice was um, muscular tension I discovered in this process of awakening that a great deal of our confusion of identity rests on identification with muscular tension in the body. We usually carry a, a great density uh, of muscular tension, often in the chest or in the forehead, usually in, in the forehead where the thinker lives, the sense of me as a separate self, or in the chest as the doer, or the feeler, or something like that. So, when we start to soften, my, my word for surrender, when we start to soften those muscular tensions, we notice that awareness is natural state when it is not unnaturally self-contracted is one of softness and spaciousness and non-locality. You know, when we're sort of dense and tight in our bodies, there's a sense of locality, a sense of density. I'm here and you are there. But when we start to soften that and come more into a natural state of openness and non-aggressive, non-self-protective presence, first of all, it's just much more pleasant. No big deal. It's just pleasant to be undefended. And it hurts to be defended. And I know this is difficult going through a city like London, which is so harsh, you know, energetically. So how do you go through life in a city like London in a state of soft innocence when people are so energetically dense and sort of muscular you know, knots and so forth? <laughs> and that is a question of integration you know, over time. It does not happen overnight necessarily. It does take time to bring this softness into our bodies and into our daily interactions with people so that it's seamless and, um, and natural of integration, of um, allowing the cells to get 
you know, the inside, having that penetrate the cells and it sort of rewiring the neural circuitry in a sense. And that's a big part of this. It's a, what I call in the book a timeless process though. It's not a process where you are becoming a better person or becoming more enlightened or, you know, in any way better than anyone else. It's a timeless process, meaning that in every moment you're complete and whole and you recognize yourself as such. And yet there is a kind of a relative evolution where you're bringing this understanding into your felt experience so that all of your experiences and relationships are permeated by the love and the light that you truly are. So it is ultimately about love. It is ultimately about love. And that is, I would say, my core message. You know, I, um, for me, awakening means nothing if love is not brought into the equation. You know? and, and in my experience, awareness is love. There is no distinction between the two. They're two words from the same, for the same reality. Love without awareness is, lacks clarity, and awareness without love lacks heart. They are, they are the same. So when we soften and empty ourselves of everything that is foreign to us, we find a spacious, open awareness within which everything is allowed to arise and fade away, but that awareness is not cold like uh, outer space or something. It's not some vacuous, uh, devoid state. It is filled with warmth and vitality, with life itself. It is life. And life is not cold. Life is warm, full of energy. So that is what the body is made of. The body is awareness in form. So the cells, what the energy that's weaving the cells together in your body and that's animating your body is awareness, is the, the life force itself. So this realization floods our whole being with um, an enormous amount of, well, joie de vivre, you know, you sort of get the life juice back. And there's something in you that um, very much moves toward affection and um, interconnectedness and expresses itself through dance or through art, uh, through beauty actually, through beauty. So for me, the natural expression of, uh, of awareness is through beauty in one way or another. Beauty is the natural expression of awareness. And I use beauty here with a capital B to distinguish it from what the human mind would call beauty and ugliness where there are two opposites, you know, quite mutually exclusive. Uh, beauty, true beauty, is not in, it is not in what you see. It is in the fact that you see. It's not in what you see. It's in the fact of seeing. And so if you see rightly with the eyes of awareness, wherever the eye lands is beautiful. And it is not doesn't have preferences or judgments. The light, the common light that illuminates anything is the light that illuminates everything. And that is what you are. That is all that is. And so all, all that happens is there gets to be a confusion because we identify with our projections rather than seeing as awareness itself. So there's just a little switch or a little, a little shift in our perspective here. It's already happening. It's already happening. So all that has to happen is for you to recognize that it's already happening. So there's not a new element that's being introduced here. It's a recognition of what has always been the case, but that there had been a forgetting of that, so to speak, in a relative sense for a little while. And then awareness recognizes itself again, and the dream is over. And reality is seen and it's full clarity, and it's full desireless clarity. Sound too good to be true? Hmm. There is something in us that loves this message because of its purity. Uh, there's something in us that recognizes the truth of it, even when the mind raises doubts and questions. Because that will, be, that will happen, and there will be a time for that in about five minutes where you raise your doubts and your questions. And they're very welcome here. 
was a big part of this, is putting the mind's doubts to rest so that we can sink deeper into the heart and abide there before the arising of any question or any doubt. And that is true peace. Peace is not in answering the questions that your mind has because there is no end to that. Peace is in the abidance of the presence, the silence, before any question or doubt arises. So it's not a question of answering your mind's doubts, but of bringing you to the doubtless presence. You cannot doubt yourself. You can doubt everything, but you cannot doubt yourself. You cannot doubt the presence of awareness. Because even if you doubted the presence of awareness, you, awareness, would have to be there to register the presence of the doubt. You cannot get away from yourself. It's impossible. So, we take ref you, I'm inviting you to take refuge in your doubtless self. It has nothing to do with me. I have no more access to awareness than you do. In the same way that no particular fish in the ocean has more access to the water than some other fish. We could say, well, a whale is really, really big. So the whale must have more access to the water than a minnow. But of course that's not true. A whale and a minnow have equal access to the water in the way that you or anyone else has access to awareness. So this is important because it displaces anyone from, from being special, anyone from having something that you don't, because if you haven't noticed, one of the great engines of, the see of seeking in life is the feeling that someone has something that I don't. Someone has something that I don't. This guru, this teacher is special. And I'm not dismissing teachers, because without them we wouldn't have anyone pointing us to our true nature. So we retain a deep love and gratitude certainly in our hearts for our teachers. I do anyway. And it's not about the teacher. It's about you. It's about coming home to yourself, which is as magnificent as myself because it's the same. And I can tell you that with full confidence, knowing precisely what I am, that it is no different from you. And this is the great message, I think, that needs to be heard right now in this time of great divisiveness, of great violence, of great, of the great sense of otherness, that this really is the ultimate meaning, as I said earlier, of democracy, the democratic rev revolution, away from the tyranny of egoic identification, you know, the totalitarian regime of separation, which is an awful, violent, dictatorial state, inwardly and outwardly. So how do we wake up out of that as a culture, as a species, and as individuals? Is there only one way? No. But this is a way. This is a way. I'm not so arrogant as to say that there's only one way to wake up. But in this moment you're hearing this particular message, so it's an invitation for you to consider that if you're open to it and go as deep into your own presence as you possibly can until you recognize the bottomless well of the presence of awareness and the infinite gifts that it has been bestowing upon you ever since your conception at the body-mind level. There is no lack in awareness, absolutely none. There is only lack in the mind. But you are not your mind. You are not your mind. And if you live at that level, we will only see separation, we will only see otherness, we will only see good and evil and right and wrong and beautiful and ugly and this or that. But when we come into the reality of this moment, you see yourself and everyone you meet. That little gleam of light in anyone's eyes is the same gleam of light in your eyes. And the presence, the presence of awareness by which you see anything has no limits, borders, edges, or boundaries. Your body may have a relative boundary, but if I ask you to point to awareness, you wouldn't be able to do it because it has no objective qualities. And that should stun you. That should stop you dead in your tracks. That the fundamental fact of experience has no objective qualities. It's not material. It's spirit. It's what we call spirit. 
so that makes it sound rather new agey or spiritual in a kind of a esoteric sense, but it is a, actually a fact of experience. So, well, we're getting towards the end so of, the, of the talk part. We'll invite questions in a moment. I just want to take a moment to ponder intuitively what I just pointed to, that awareness, which is here undoubtedly, has no objective qualities. Pure spirit, hearing these words, feeling the chair underneath you or the ground or underneath your feet, gurgling in your tummy, hearing sounds above, Pure spirit, you are pure spirit that never came into space and time, and yet space and time are inside of you momentarily as an experience. Isn't that wondrous? Isn't that utterly miraculous? You are a miracle, the greatest of all miracles. Pure love and light. that never has known otherness. So, 30 minutes on the dot. Um, I'd like to invite any um, questions or doubts or... Yes, please. Yeah, because yourself, yourself is fulfillment. When we don't recognize that our my when I don't recognize that myself is the presence of what we could call peace itself. There arises this anxious energy to find try to find peace somewhere. And so we can have we'll have an experience that will moment a great meal that will momentarily give us peace by bringing uh, into re bringing to rest that agitated energy to find peace does that make sense so far so there's a we, we don't recognize ourselves as the peaceful presence of awareness we start to f look for peace in things or experiences which will give us a momentary sense of peace because it will relieve us of the agitation of seeking peace. But what we don't recognize is that that peace abides prior to the search for it. And so when we recognize this presence as a, a kind of a peaceful, open, spacious awareness, and we bring that into the body, there's less of an anxious desire to try to find it somewhere because we realize that I'm actually the source of the peace that I've been looking for. So the momentary peace that you get in a pleasurable experience is a shadow of the peace that you are. It's momentary, and then you need another one, and there's no end to that. So what's the solution? I mean, it can't be in the experiences, because every time you get one, it fades, and you need a new one. So we have to reorient our vision to recognize that there is actually something that abides prior to that going out of myself for something. It's Okay, let me give you the biggest thing I realized, the biggest insight in this regard, okay? The mind misinterprets peace as boring. When I realized that, it shifted everything. The mind misinterprets peace as boring. So it will try to fill the boring void with activity. And when I recognize that, wait a second, peace is really what the mind is looking for. It simply misinterpreted it as boring. I could rest. I could really rest deeply there. And that dissolved the seeking energy altogether over time. Does that resonate? Well, I don't really believe in that. Tell me, boring tell me. Peace or, huh? Like, boring is uh, the thing I'm running away from because like, just sitting down, meditating, I find that boring. Right. And you're saying there's peace in that. But I'm suffering no. in that boring. <laughs> yes, yes. Right. Well, because there's a, mis there's a misperception that the mind has. It's an interpretation that the mind has. That peace is boring. But how could peace be boring? 
because the other, the other option is being in constant frenzied activity, turmoil, trying to find peace, and that doesn't feel good, right? So the other, the other option is to rest here, you know, and recognize that resting is actually what the body and the mind are looking for. So the first thing is the direct path is still a path, you know. It is still a path of, of inquiry, and it does take time in a relative sense. Of course, there's no time, but if we're going to make a concession to the belief in the ticking of time, objective, you know, in an objective sense, we, we could say that self-inquiry and a progressive path are both paths. The direct path begins where the progressive path ends with the question, who am I? So that's the beginning of the direct path. Mm -hmm. In the progressive path, you would meditate for decades and purify the body and the mind in order to get to a place where you could ask that question, that final question, who is the meditator? And be prepared to recognize it because you're in a more subtle state. But with the direct path, you don't have to have any preparatory meditative techniques to ask that question. You begin with the most profound, fundamental question that you could possibly ask, which is, who am I, or who is the meditator? And you drill deep into that one place. But it is still a path of meditation, because you still have to really... It's not a mental question that one asks oneself. It is a meditative, contemplative exploration at the level of, of, of uh, intuition of the nature of self. And it is a process of discarding everything that you're not in order to arrive at the obvious clarity that you are empty and yet fully present. You know, so that's a process of discrimination and what we would call you know, discrimination. So there's no one there's no one answer to this question. It's what really what resonates with your heart. You know, if there are some meditative techniques that you find useful and that are, you know, culturing some new sort of way of being in you, then I would say that that's in alignment for you. If it feels right and it is coming from your heart to do that. If you're doing it because you think you should, I would say that is not a good reason to do it. You know, make joy, the joy of exploration, your motivation for these things. You know, not a, sort of a harshness. That was, when I was saying earlier, I, I did Zen for years when I started this path. And it can, it's a beautiful path. And it has a harshness to it. You know. So, you know, or you could just put all of your chips on self-inquiry and drill deep within in that one place to get at the core of the answer to that question, which of course is nonverbal, beyond the mind. So that's a question of temperament and of what's right for you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Okay, thank you so much. I can't think you say something. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you never know. I never know what I'm going to say. So, yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so we're not test. You, you can't become more aware. You awareness can't become more aware. So the way I describe it in the book, there, there are a couple of different stages. The first step is to become aware that you are already aware. So that's not a question of more awareness per se. It's a subtle... Awareness is already on full blast. It, the, the dial is turned all the way up. You are sensing and perceiving fully right now talking about it, which sound it, it's a little misleading. Because um, I'm really trying to point in this moment to like a direct recognition of the reality of your experience. We can talk about it in terms of stages. Um, but it's a little misleading. It, in terms of the direct path which is really what I'm offering in this moment. Well, it would be like a fish asking, is there something I have to do to get more aware of the water? That, so it's, from my perspective, it's a, it's, it's a curious question, but I understand the question. So I'll just ask you now, are you aware? I guess I am. Well, Can you doubt it? <laughs> See, that's the thing. You're not, you're not sure about the fact of your experience, which is a curious phenomenon. Okay. All right, let me answer your question then at, at the level at which you're asking the question. So um, 
one one thing you can do is to um, do meditations that quiet your mind. You know, you can have a more subtle mind where your thoughts are quieter and more in abeyance, and um, that will allow you possibly to recognize another level of being which is not mind-based, not thought-based, and that's just subtler, we could say. And that's a process of, we could say, purification. So there are many, many ways to do that. Mantra and um, concentration meditation, samadhi meditation, various levels to purify the level of mind. You are not purifying consciousness. You're purifying mind. Consciousness cannot be purified. It is utterly pure. It has never been tainted. It has never been more or less than it is in this moment. But mind can be more or less subtle and purified. But there has to be at some point a shift from identification with mind to yourself. And that you can do through those, you know, one way is through those more traditional meditative techniques. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. So is this shift that you're talking about, um, so if there's a, a space of awareness, that's a, a space of resting, non-doing, simply being, and then, um, which is also can be boring, um, to a, a subtle sense of duality, which is judging it, Yes. And so that's yes. kind of not it. Uh, or the, and, uh, but then there's the other flip of fixation on the contents of awareness, yep. which is kind of heavily sort of dualistic. So you've got your nice, simple, relaxed, spacious awareness, and then there's uh, yeah. a sort of sort of doing, a uh, sort of dualistic sort of fixation, which then thinks, but I'm aware of this and this and this, and yeah. then starts forming opinions and judgments yeah. and starts striving to kind of achieve and get something, mm -hmm. and that's the striving and yeah. the, uh, the desire to achieve is the thing that's obscuring the ability to be able to rest in the awareness which is there in yeah. both states. In both states, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and the seeking is also awareness. There's nothing but awareness mm -hmm. at rest and in, mm. in movement. Mm. It's just awareness in two modes, mm. both at the same time. But we seem to have a preference for the, we want to get to the nice, happy, what we call to right. like the happy, resty space of like, sure. I'm resting in awareness and it's kind of non-dual and it's fabulous. But the sort of, and the contents, there's a confusion and a fixation and a caught, getting caught up in, which kind of forms the basis of the confusion. Yeah. But the confusion is arising out of awareness. Yes, made out of awareness. Oh, right. Yeah, it's awareness that seems to fall asleep and seems to wake up. Oh, right. So it, it seems like the, the the extent to which one requires a method depends on the extent to which one is able to simply rest and be and non-do, or, or if one's confused or fixated, then there's a need for method to um, sort of cut through the sort of fixation and the entanglement there can with be. the content of awareness. There can be. Yeah, you know, it's it's a question. It's it's different for for each of us. You know, the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not just a matter of hanging out in the rest of non-dual space of awareness, because awareness is also very active. Mm -hmm. you know, and it is it, it, it does everything. It is a doer. Mm -hmm. It is the doer. Mm -hmm. You know, in all the doing. Mm -hmm. So, at some point, we have to recognize that awareness is not just rested and at peace, but also it is the it's in the totality of mm -hmm. movement. And it's in the, it's in mm -hmm. all of this. It's mm -hmm. doing all of this, like all just crackling inside of itself, mm -hmm. so that we don't hang out just in the rested place, which is a, which can be a kind of a very life-negating place to be. But there's being within that. But yeah, but there's it's how you be within that dance yes. Yes. of um, display of awareness. Yes. It's like you can be with it being caught up and entangled and having yeah. an expectation yes. and desire yes. and need and want and yes. restlessness. Well yeah. Or you can be in the sense of openness and spaciousness and enjoyment of the display. Well, well said. Yeah. So Good. Yeah. That resonates. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, thank you. <laughs>